Hello, and welcome to Season 3 of Beyond Teaching, a series featured on the Psych Sessions Network. This series is hosted by Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University, Adyinka Akinsular smith from City College of New York, City University of New York, Asani Sewell from Pacific University, and yours truly, Eric Landrum from Boise State University. To be a successful psychology academic or professional, it takes more than teaching research or clinical skills. That is, today's professionals were probably not taught everything they need to know in graduate school. The Psych Sessions podcast, Beyond Teaching, strives to fill that gap. We chat about the topics we need to know about to be successful in our careers, but we didn't know to ask about in graduate school. When we don't have the expertise among us, we go out and find someone. And this is particularly relevant in Season 3. These 10 episodes were recorded from June 7th through November 2nd, 2021, and they are being released starting December 29th, 2021, and Season 3 will finish on March 30th, 2022. What are you in for? Oh, the places we'll go. We'll chat about leveraging social media, publications, and playing that classic academic game, how to make decisions about co-authoring, dealing with student requests for accommodations and exceptions, which seems especially relevant in this era, and maximizing student office hours, or what are called student hours these days. Also in Season 3, we invited a number of guests to come on the podcast and share their expertise with us. This included Sun Yung Lee in Saikai's Faculty Support Advisory Committee and what Saikai can do for faculty, Loretta McGregor and the difference between mentoring and advising, with extra information about imposter phenomenon tossed in for good measure. Sandy Jenkins and James Lane share their experience from two accumulated careers about clinical supervision. And Beatrice Krauss shares her delightful adventures in retirement, which depart greatly from our retirement stereotypes or typical tropes. We truly hope that you'll enjoy season three of Beyond Teaching. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Beyond Teaching. We're not quite sure who's with us for this episode, so you'll have to stay tuned and listen to see who's with us and who's chatting with us. But we're excited we have a special guest with us. So I'm Eric Landrum, and I'm joined for certain with my colleague and friend, Asani Sewell. But, and I never, so Sun Young, I don't know if I ever say your first name right or not. I'm never confident. So will you please introduce yourself and tell us about your affiliation and your department, please? <laughs> okay. First of all, thank you for having me. Even for Koreans, it's not easy to pronounce my first name, but it is pronounced as Sunyan. Sunyan. Yes. Thank you for being patient with me. I appreciate it. Not at all. You did a great job. And I'm an associate professor of psychology at the University of Arkansas at Monticello. It's one of the U of A campus located in Southeast Arkansas. And Monticello is obviously a small town that holds a population of 9,900. Okay. And we don't have a department of psychology per se. We only have a psych major with whole faculty including myself, and I belong to School of Social and Behavior Sciences, I mean, which can actually serve as department. And I've been a member of Psychi since 2014 as a primary faculty advisor. So our chapter activity has been pretty much based on my supervision because when I first got here, they literally just assigned me as a primary faculty and we've been growing ever since then. I'm also a member of APA, SPSP, and also Society for Teaching of Psychology. <laughs> well, that's awesome because that last one, Society for the Teaching of Psychology, that's, uh, 
STP. That one, is, we also have with us today, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce them, although they think they're going to be silent the whole time. Susan Nolan, who is currently the STP president as we speak from Seton Hall, she's with us. And Yinka Akinsiller Smith from, and I, it's a very long name. It's CCNYCUNY in New York City. And I probably got those out of order. And Yinka, I apologize for that. Oh, all right. She's giving me thumbs up. And I've already forgotten the, the emphasis on the syllable. Sunya. I did. I said it wrong. Help me again. Sunyan. Sunyan. Thank you. Uh, it's, Doc, it's Dr. Lee. I want to make sure that we got that in properly as well. You've been act. You said you've been active and involved primarily with Psychi since 2014. And one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on today. And I'm going to stop talking so much here in a moment. Tell us a little bit about how we think about Psychi as an organization for students, but we want to shift gears a little bit. Tell us about how faculty members can leverage the opportunities, A, for their students, but B, for themselves. If you wouldn't mind walking us through what opportunities are out there for us. That is a very good question. In fact, I mean, many of those faculty members that has been really active to other professional organizations that they know, such as APA and also STP, we mentioned. But then Saikai is also a professional organization as well. And some of them has been pretty much active as their student. And the one benefit that they have found from Sidekai is the lifelong membership, meaning that once they pay their dues, it goes forever. So they try to actually leverage their advancements. I mean, not just about being their um, students, but also being as their faculty to actually encourage excellence in scholarship and also the best of science of psychology. So. By having active chapter activities, they also try to promote themselves about their teaching skills and then promoting their scholarships and also facilitating mentorship as well to actually increase their membership as well. And also they try to provide resources for leadership and also creativities along with community events and also volunteering activities that actually make their studies like interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary and try to actually bring out some open science so that students can actually not just only engage in it, but also replicate existing studies that they're interested in and then try to build up a larger community based on their activities. So. Faculty altogether actually have a lot of interesting activities that actually make um, Psychi stronger. It's so interesting to hear you say that because I became a Psychi member when I was an undergraduate psychology student yeah. back in 2003, let's say. <laughs> and I've not really thought much about my Psychi membership or status, quite honestly, until this conversation right now. So I hadn't thought about the ways that it could benefit me as a faculty member. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. I think one thing that I hadn't considered was the lifetime membership option. So that sounds like that's an opt-in, right? So I, you know, paid some dues or my department paid dues when I was an undergraduate, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that the, my membership is now expired or is dormant. Do you know anything about that piece? Or am I always a Psychi member, just inactive? Well, that's another good question. I mean, when I first became a member or students that actually turned out to be a Saikai member, a lot of the time I found out that they signed up their membership during their undergraduate, but then sometimes they didn't find their membership exist or not because they keep moving to another institutions and forgot about it. Or there are cases the chapter turned out to be inactive so that the advisor has to actually make their chapter active status. In my case, I know I signed up for Saikai when I was a junior year, but then when I actually moved to one of the Northeast Coast for my master's degree, I forgot about it. And eventually I ended up having my master's degree in comparative literature, which has nothing to do with psychology. 
Then I applied my PhD in educational psychology and starting out, wait a minute, I had my membership, so I have to dig in. <laughs> my first and everything. And fortunately, I mean, if the record is there, then you're still a member. I just have to make my status as an active and try to actually find out what are the opportunities out there there during my graduate school year and also after I graduate, what are the things that I can get involved? Then I came to this institution as a faculty member right after my PhD. And then for the things that all my boss asked me to do, my team, is to become a primary faculty sponsor of a psychi. So I was like, okay, the things happen for a reason. And then starting out that I was thinking, okay, so I was a student, but then now I was a faculty. How can I possibly bridge between faculty and students to make my major grow? Then, then I didn't know what to do from the very beginning, but I started to think, okay, so if I were an undergraduate student sitting in the classroom and if the faculty actually talk about different types of opportunities and get involved as an honor society, the one of the things that they would be interested in. And I also think about they have lots of classes, they have at least a one or two part-time jobs, and that they're still catching things up. So I didn't want to actually overload what they're doing. I want to be realistic back with the members. I was like, okay, so if the students are interested or actively involved in community services, so I can begin with that. So I started out actually hosting a blood drive, which we often involved in twice a year annually. And then we actually hosted a booth nearby there and then introduced our society and the beginning brought right there. We revised our bulletin board, our brochure to actually make new members get more excited about it. And then we also brought some Skinner's Fox and then do some experiment and then and let pre-college students get excited about what honor society to do and then what psychology means and then what psychology major can actually benefit their careers, that kind of stuff. We also participated in school activities, go to local elementary middle school and talk about bullying interventions and what school psychologists to do. That was pretty fast. They expanded that students love about it. And when my colleagues actually enter as a new faculty member, I mean, they clearly remember that they also joined the sci when they were undergraduate or graduate student. But they could figure out where their members card is. I contacted the headquarters to find out their members and numbers. And then they started out actually bringing their students to regional conference to actually make their student presented. So that's a small step. And then they also bring out the best students to the national conference like APA and A to make them actually have some better experience. And uh, starting from there, we also apply the research and then trouble grant to make them succeed. And then we realize that there are quite a few resources that can easily facilitate for student side, but then compared to student side, we also need those the faculties actually promote those types of activities. So starting from this year, we finally got one of the committees called Faculty Support Advisory Board. And then luckily I was appointed and I am appointed as a faculty director of the committee to actually support our faculty to find our sources for how to facilitate the membership and then how to actually write grant proposals or how to actually develop their teaching modules and then how to advise their students if you are the newbie as a faculty advisor, those kind of stuff. So Asani, just to circle back to a couple items to reemphasize. So once you're a member, you're always a member. It's a lifetime membership, as we've already mentioned. And if you went to psychi.org, psychi.org, and you logged in, there, there's a membership prompt there that you could submit and you could ask for, what's my membership number? And in a day or so, they could look it up 
for you and get it. And <clears throat> Yinka, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if you, I'm not surprised that you're a member, of course. Um, you this can conversation have... is triggering something in my brain. <laughs> I think <laughs> when I was in my master's program back in, I think I was a member. I, That's an audio I edit. Put my pin upstairs. Yeah. You get a little pin, right? Not, yes, you do. Uh, you get a stole. A there was a stole also. I yeah, your university might have given you a stole. You might have bought it. You might have gotten a membership card. But the national, the central office can reissue you uh, a credential with a password. And, and then you can opt in to whatever you want. It's much like your alumni office, uh, Asani, for you at Seton Hall. Once you opt in and allow them to email you, and you can get that newsletter, your class of 2003, I think you said. They'll send you a lot of emails or you can say, whoa, just send me a couple. So Psyche does a really nice job of they'll send out something, an alumni newsletter for graduates from their uh, undergraduate. And by the way, master's level students can become members of Psyche. And there are master's level benefits. So, so you don't have to remember the pin and your original undergraduate, um, your undergraduate email address. The folks at Psych I can figure that out for you. You might have to remember the name that you had as an undergraduate and the institution. Those are probably the two key variables. That I know. So that's easy enough. Yeah. But I'm so glad we're having this conversation because my long lost membership, my goodness, I need to get back into Psych I again. That's really great to know. And I'm going to, yeah. Susan here, I'm just going to say one quick thing. You can join as a faculty member, even if you never joined, if your undergraduate institution didn't have it, it's not too late to join and take advantage of the benefits. Yes. And I, when I actually have induction ceremony, I typically make the each member's card with this, a plastic bag on it so that they can actually keep it or store it in some secure place that as long as you have the membership number and then you go to another institution and that institution is a psychic chapter, most likely then you can just bring in and then make your membership active. And the many students of mine has been done that and that's wonderful. And, and there are specific faculty member benefits. There are, uh, at least I remember from my time on the board, there were some specific, a handful of specific grant programs to support faculty development, faculty research. One of the really delightful things about Psychi is that almost all of the resources are not password protected. So Psychi gives away just about everything on their website. Have I mentioned Psychi.org? I don't know if I've mentioned Psychi.org yet. But to students, to faculty, the research support, Sin Young mentioned already about the replication support and supporting open science. Saikai was on that before it was popular. Folks like John Gray and others that were really on the forefront of that way in advance of it becoming popular in, in mainstream psychology. Eric and Sun Young, are there, isn't there also a Psychi journal for publishing student research? I think I remember that from my undergraduate. There is. And since you became an undergraduate, it has graduated, if you will, from an undergraduate journal to a fully fledged journal. It has faculty peer review. It is no longer an undergraduate student journal. It is indexed in Psych Info in EBSCO. It remember off the top of my head what the impact factor is, but it did launch as the Psychi Journal of Undergraduate Student Research, and that is no longer the title. I believe it's the Psychi Journal of Psychological Research. Yes, that's correct. And that uh, it goes through like a rigorous peer review journal process like other journals do. And as long as that the research is, well, outstanding or if Student authors think it is a good research. We do encourage them to actually submit it because the quality of the research is the key. And that as long as the primary author is our member, most of the time it's all members are psychi members that they submit it. But at least bottom line is the primary author has to be a psychi member. That I mean, I mean, we encourage their submissions and. Debbie Brennan is the editor of this journal, I believe. And we also do encourage our Psychi faculty members to serve as a peer reviewer so that they also have their experience of the journal review, which isn't really mandatory, but it actually benefits the faculty members how to do peer review journal. So 
the quality has been pretty much higher ever since I produced those general manuscripts. So, so we are pretty much happy that more members are getting involved to publish their manuscript or actually going through the rigorous peer review journals as a reviewer. Yeah, the one thing I would say that's maybe slightly different about the Psyche Journal is that there is enhanced emphasis on um, the learning for s submitters from reviews. In other words, harsh reviews without a learning outcome are pretty much forbidden. So if you're going to reject a manuscript, it's going to be a learning experience for the authors. I mean, it's a Psyche product. So it's all about learning. It's all about growth. And it's not about, it's not about automatic acceptance. It is about a learning experience, which I think uh, is something it'd be nice if other journal editors would adopt in our discipline. Absolutely. I do remember that. I think I had a student or two submit a paper. Perhaps it was still when it was a student only journal, maybe, but the reviews came back and I was like, oh, these are, that's nice. You have to edit some things, turn some things around, but they were, yeah, it, it was a learning experience. It was much more pleasant. I think the students didn't feel discouraged by the comments that they received back. Now for this journal submissions, if you're a faculty member submitting, do you need to have student co-authors or is it okay for it to be uh, faculty Psi Chi membership with no student co-authors? That is a great question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double check before I answer that. All right. Looking for the answer in live time. <laughs> yeah. You know, evidence-based response. I love it when I can stump Eric, actually. What other questions can I, I ask? I just don't <laughs> want to give you a wrong answer. That's all. You can stump me about a lot of things. Let's just be you can give me a wrong answer and then follow up with an email to correct it later. <laughs> We can edit the gap out. Yeah, I think you should. I think you should tell our listeners what you just found. I I just found. Oh, oh I I thought I was muted. So I just found that actually I am a member of Kappa Delta Pi, another honor society. <laughs> you add this to your resume. We was really. I, I mean, I, I realize <laughs> I just found it. I've done nothing with it. I'm almost. Em I'm embarrassed. Well, when someone's got so many honors, it's oh, no do, Yinka. It's hard to track. You also almost need honors tracking software for you. That's what it is. I'm sure there's an app for that. There's got to be an app for that, right? To track. Your well, I would look to Susan for that kind of information. Absolutely. Given her award status. Shut up. <laughs> I think this is... A <laughs> I think this is really valuable because I think probably not just Psychi, but other honors organizations can provide value to us as faculty members. So I, I greatly appreciate you, Sin Young, talking with us about Psychi and the benefits. Because I think a lot of people don't even think that these organizations that they joined as undergrads or awards that they were awarded as undergrads could be useful to them now. So I'm a... Can I ask a question that might be a little bit controversial, which is why don't more, more faculty know about this? Do you think that Psychi has a promotion challenge in terms of faculty more widely knowing that their Psychi membership and undergraduate continues, you know, throughout their entire lifetime? Do you have any thoughts about that? Or maybe it's just me. Yeah, maybe I, I do, but I, I, I was going to go ladies first. I'm my number one answer is I'm often surprised by the fact how easily I forget. You learn so hard, but you easily forget, you know, that's a part of the college load. I mean, we have lots of stuff going on and undergraduate actually requires lots of hard work and you can just focus on your major field. I mean, it, it's different than what graduate work looks like. So, I mean, Many students got so excited about joining some kind of honor society like a Psychi, but then once they graduate and some of them actually turn out to be working at the private sector and then sometimes they just forget about how uh, 
actively they have been involved and in whether it's a lifetime membership because it's a one-time fee. We don't charge like annually, like other organizations, something like that. So they know it's there, but they just don't prioritize the membership upfront. Graduate schools also have different activities going on and sometimes they forget, oh, now I remember I have a Saikai membership, but then they were like, okay, now what am I supposed to do with the membership turned out to be a often the fundamental questions and often that question actually lead on to the faculty member and even for you that you know you are now start to say wait a minute i think i used to have a membership when i was an undergraduate but then i never actually thought about actually reactivating my membership and then benefit from society so I would say it's one of our just cognitive load that actually make us work at. Sunyeon, so your position also, you're the director of Psychi's Faculty Support Advisory Committee. Is that a new role? Because I wonder if that reason that we faculty members don't know is because only recently Psychi has appointed someone. Are you the first in that role, I think? My understanding is that we used to actually have this committee a long time ago, but I mean, that was primarily for those who became faculty sponsors. So, so we focused on more of the advisor role rather than those who are faculty and that also have our membership because you really don't have to be a, a faculty sponsor. I mean, you can just be a member and you can be a faculty, but not necessarily a advisory role, but then Last November, they advertised that they're going to actually establish this as a faculty support to actually help members of our faculty, not just faculty sponsor, but faculty as a whole. So, so I applied and I luckily got appointed as a new director of a faculty support committee beginning in January. So it's fairly new because we revamped a little bit and then actually made this committee to actually support our members of our faculty. So those who are teaching community college, those who are teaching four-year institutions or adjunct or actually serving as a teacher, they're more than welcome to join us. Yeah, I think there's one distinction that's important to make here. There's all kinds of support that floods in for chapter advisors. Mm -hmm. So Susan, whoever's your chapter advisor at Seton Hall, they've been hearing for from Psychi ad nauseum throughout their term of service is doing now is providing support for all the faculty folks who are not chapter advisors. And that's the new role. I think to, to come back to your question, Psychi lives in that primordial acronym soup that we all live in professionally of APA and APS and Psychi and Psybeta and SPSP and all the things and organizations that try to get our professional attention and try to give us resources, I'm sorry, STP and everybody else that want to help us and have some amazing resources, things like psych sessions even. And each of us only has so much bandwidth and we literally forget, I, I Jung said it perfectly, the cognitive load. Uh, we only can have so much on our plate. And I think for some people, Psychi catches their fancy. For others, it's STP. For others, it's the APS Teaching Institute. And I think Psychi has somewhat struggled with a, an image problem or maybe not even a problem, but just a lack of image awareness. And I think they work on that. And then like everybody else, a pandemic hit. And so it's going to be back to square one or maybe back to square 10 and to remake that. But really, it's psychi.org has all kinds of things to give away. Sonny, I want to circle back. What was your specific question about the journal? Oh, my question about the journal was, as a faculty member, do you need to have student co-authors in order to publish in the Psychi journal? I, I think you do. One author, either a first author or co-author, is required to be a member of Psychi at time of submission. So it, I suppose maybe that means that you could have three Psychi faculty members. So maybe technically you don't have to have a student member, but you must have at least one Psychi member be a co-author. I'm reading from their website. Got it. 
Good to know. Hmm. And if that student research, as far as I remember, I mean, student author must have a faculty sponsor as the corresponding author. Okay. And then the member has to be Psychi member as well. Yeah, it's indexed in PsychInfo, EBSCO, Crossref, and Google Scholar databases. And the rejection rate is 57% rejection rate. Hmm. Which accepted rate um, going by 2019 is 42.25%. So, Yep. Anything else for Sun Young before we thank her for her time with us today? Anything else that anybody has for her? Not just the people who self-muted. I'm just, it's just opened my eyes to something I had completely forgotten about. So it's, it's good food for thought. And I think it's a resource that you can easily pass along to mm -hmm. your colleagues. And it, it also, I think it's the kind of thing that you might not have time for now, but in two years, you might have, or you might have a student who comes along and says, hey, I, I've got an idea for a research project, but I need a couple thousand dollars. Well, what? If you're a psych I member. I actually know a resource where you might be able to apply for a scholarship or some grant support. It, it, it may not be something that everybody can jump on now, but I think it's one of those things that you keep in your hip pocket to recommend for others or when uh, your bandwidth becomes available, it could be an outstanding resource. And many of our resources are pretty much free of charge. So of those are easily accessible. And then uh, you can also make it as an e-copy for yourself for the future use. So I really hope that our members can actually benefit from those resources and then excel themselves pretty well. And as a frequent listener of podcasts where I sometimes listen to part of it and then pick it back up the next time, I love it when podcasts end by reminding the listener whom we're speaking with. So I just want to remind everybody that we've been talking with Sinyan Lee, who is a professor at the University of Arkansas at Monticello and the director of SciKai's Faculty Support Advisory Committee. I'm so grateful to have you here. Thank you for having me again. Thank you. That was great.